Good morning, folks. How are you? Just waiting to see how much of a delay we have here and if my audio is working. It's about 20 some seconds on my end for a delay, but you should be seeing a economic calendar. This is Econo Day's calendar. And tomorrow is the day before CPI on Tuesday. This is the day that the market's going to get wrecked. <laughs> it's going to be a mess. So you want to be very, very careful and don't participate at all on uh, Tuesday prior to CPI. Now, after CPI hits, you know, there's nothing wrong with going in, going after whatever remains in terms of liquidity or imbalances. But prior to, <laughs> you don't, you don't want to do that. Okay. You don't want to do that at all. So be mindful of that for this week and the rest of the week calendar i'll talk about that as we go via twitter but monday's kind of light and because it's ahead of cpi our expectations are not terribly elevated because of the news driver that will be on tuesday which is usually a one shot right away one-way street just completely runs over top of the market. So just be careful with that. Okay, you should be seeing the dollar index. I'll wait until the live stream shows me that I'm actually on that chart with all of you. Yeah, it's not showing me the chart. Give me one second. Glad I checked. Otherwise, this would have been very... Annoying. All right, so you should be seeing the dollar index chart now. Work in progress. <laughs> Okay, now we have the chart. All right, so we have a daily chart of the dollar index. And here's the weekly chart. Now, right away, one of the things I noticed first glance with you is we have taken out a short-term low on the weekly chart of the dollar index. We have overlapped entirely the gap that's between this candle's low and this candle's high. We have this large wick here. So midpoint of that, you want to annotate that for consequent encroachment. So it looks real close to this candle's opening. I'm just going to you know, roughly eyeball it to around 104.80 to 104.85. I mentioned how we had 
I'm going to try to keep my charts clean and just talk about specific price points. So that way you can annotate your own charts instead of just using mine and being content with that. I know some of you are mad about that now. So we came back down inside this buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency, this candle here. And we've already completely overlapped the weekly gap. So we have buy side here, an old volume imbalance here. So this volume imbalance, this buy side liquidity pool, and the weekly consequent encouragement level on that weekly gap high. Those three levels are my premium arrays that I'm watching going forward for this week. The discount arrays for the dollar is the consequent encouragement of this wick here. Now, let me remind you, I do not know where the market opens on Sunday. No one does. That's a, that's a complete mystery. So we all have to wait and see how the market itself starts its week. Whatever that new opening price is on Sunday, that's when we have the data to start working with it. Right now, we have no idea where it's going to open. So I have to give my students and I have to record my observations, both premium and discount. I cannot frame a narrative. Now I'm going to share with you what I think might happen this week. Don't read that much into it because it's before Sunday's opening. Right now it's 10 minutes or not. Well, yeah, 10 minutes or so before 10 a.m. Sunday morning. So we have hours before the market actually opens up. But I'm hopefully inspiring you to look at both sides of premium and discount. And then when we open up, what do we gravitate towards? And then obviously keeping our expectations low on Monday because the CPI number that comes out on Tuesday, that's the real carnage. That's the, that's the move that's going to do a lot of the violence. And I'll give you my opinion what I think might happen. I've been wrong a lot with CPI when I try to forecast what they're going to do beforehand. That's why I don't trade ahead of it. Because if I had a method to trust what it was going to do beforehand, look how fast it moves. It's typically moving anywhere between 50 to 100 plus handles when it's released. So when the market absorbs that CPI data, it's just like, wow, it goes and just immediately rips. And you don't want to be in that on the wrong side. So do not try to trade ahead of CPI. It will hurt you. So the discount arrays for the market, which is below market price, we're assuming if you looked at the chart right now and it was live data, market price, the closing price right here is 103.578. So below that price, we have this low for sell side liquidity. We have the buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency, consequent encroachment, which would be here, which is also pretty much the consequent encroachment of this wick, the midpoint of that wick. Okay. And we have a volume imbalance down here. So make sure those are annotated on your chart going forward. As soon as the market opens up, on Sunday. You're going to make a measurement of the midpoint between Friday's closing price, wherever Sunday's closing price is, and the difference between the two, that's consequent encouragement for the new week opening gap. You'll do that for every market you follow. If you're Forex, you're going to be dealing with dollar index and whatever Forex pair you trade with. Since I'm teaching predominantly with the medium of the E-mini S&P this year, we would be doing that with the opening price on Sunday in relationship to Friday's closing price on E-mini S&P and then splitting that range in half. And then that, in that entire range, there's three specific levels. We carry that all the way through till Friday's close because the market's going to refer back to it as many of you already discovered it. That's, that's a true statement and it repeats. So those are the levels for dollar index I like, and we're going to go into Euro. All right, so I kept some lipstick on this, and I didn't want to have it on there. I apologize. So you, you can see what we talked about before and the, re, the reactions thereof. 
though by Shadow Cody Pole, they swept that, took it up into the fair bay gap I mentioned. If we get above here, it can expand up into that. Go back and look at January's commentary on my YouTube channel. I can't edit it. I can't change it. I can't make it look good for me now. It's there. It's been there. We went up into it here. We broke down. Small little fair bay gap in here, which we repriced to here in yesterday, or Friday rather. Uh, we had a nice displacement lower. You want to carry that range out because if we go through it and come back up, it may act as resistance, the low and the midpoint of it, consequent encroachment, which is based on this candle right here, uh, the 9th of January, 2023. So that daily candle is your fair value gap on your daily time frame. If we accelerate lower with higher dollar, sell size the next draw on liquidity. You want to use the consequent encroachment of that wick as well. So it could come down here, just fall short of it. I'm assuming, I'm taking a great deal of liberty by saying if it does go lower, because that's pretty much already indicating what I'm expecting. I'm expecting higher dollar. I'm expecting you know, lower prices on other assets like equities and Forex, foreign currencies. So if we do break lower and we get this weakness, Midpoint of that wick right here, consequent encroachment, it could drop down there, not take out that low. So in your notes, anytime there is a, a short, stubby little wick, okay, and what do I mean by that? Um, it would look like, look how big the candle is here. Let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, see how long this candle is and then how little the, the tail is, the little wick? That to me is a very short, stubby little wick. In relationship, how am I, how am I basing whether a, a wick above a candle or below a candle is stubby and short? It's relative to its candle size from high to low. So that way there's your reference point versus something like this. So you have a, a long wick and it's the majority of the entirety of the candle. See that? So in relationship, this tail or wick on the low of the candle is short and stubby. And many times you're going to find, this is what you want to have in your journal and in your study notes. Many times that type of low will get probed without going through it. And it'll stop at consequent encroachment work right there. So in other words, give me a visual of what I'm referring to. It could drop down, come right to it, or just below it a little bit. And then retrace, and then at a later time come back down through it. Whereas a long wicked candle, generally, if you're on the right direction, in other words, if you're looking at a wick like this and you're bearish, uh, many times it'll go right to consequent encroachment and stop dead in its tracks and go the other way. Or if it's really weak, it'll only up, go up like one quarter of the wick stop right there, not even go to consequent encroachment, and then drop. The instances that it does that very thing, that is a real hard line indicator that you are in a very bearish market. Because generally, you want to see the algorithm reprice back to consequent encroachment of a wick. If you're bearish, if, if it's a very, very long wick like that, consequent encroachment, which is the midpoint of the long wick gaps, they are they're barriers. But if it can't even reach that while you're bearish, and it goes to the quarter range of the entirety of that wick, not the, not the full body high and low, where the wick is generated from the high down to, in this case, because it's a higher closing candle, you'd be using that closing price too high. And those relationships will serve you well if you go forward. The, uh, the other thing I want to teach about uh, this morning for wicks is, when you have a area where the candles create a wick, like for instance, like right here, see that? The body comes down essentially to the old fair value gap high there. And then the next candle we open here, we trade back down to the body of the candle, I'm sorry, the opening or the high end rather of the fair value gap on this candle right here. I'm trying to be mindful of keeping my mouse still because apparently when I'm talking, I'm talking and my mouse has already moved. So there's a little bit of a 
misalignment from the the live streaming. So it's something I'm trying to make a conscious effort of remembering. But we have this wick on this small little down close candle right here. The next candle, when it opens and trades up and comes back down, if we have this candle here go up to what would be a, almost essentially the midpoint or consequent encroachment of the next candle, we don't even know that it's going to you know, create this pattern. But we don't know it. But should it form that, generally you will see the consequent encroachment of that wick. If it's bearish, it won't reach it. And you can see that happening right here. I'm not cherry picking that. I'm showing you to go into your charts and you'll see that is the case because this candle here is a precursor. Then you get the actual wick here that's on the high. And when you see me sometimes taking live executions and I'm entering trades, I'm sometimes using that very criteria right there and trusting that as I'm seeing the candle open and trades right up to that point here, I'm trusting that it won't even go through consequent encroachment. I'm not fearful of it because it's that type of signature I'm looking for. It's kind of like justify the confidence behind the idea. So anyway, we have the order block here. So that high, which is the level that's already being shown here, make sure your fair value gap is noted. So if we go through the low end of it, which is this candle's high, so this candle's high on the January 6th, if we trade through that to the downside here, I'm expecting the low of that rectangle, which is the high of that candle here, and consequent encroachment, which is the midpoint between January 10th low and January 6th high. So you would split that in half for consequent encroachment. So I wouldn't want to see it trade back above that level. If we go below it, leave that range, and then come back and touch it here, or as go as deep as, but preferably not, the midpoint of that fair value gap that's shaded in blue. And then I would look for a run into this wick and or consequent encouragement. Now, if we do take out this low, go over here to the left, there's no imbalance in here. There's just a small little sell side liquidity pool here. There's really no balance in here. I'm sorry, no imbalance here. Nothing in here because this high is pretty much this low. This candle's high. It's pretty much this candle's low. There's no imbalance in here because this completely overlapped this. So the next period of liquidity would be here. My interest would be there. So am I, am I saying that it's going to be a straight crash down there? No. But I'm thinking if we do get below this and we start respecting all of the premium arrays and anything that would be considered bullish keeps getting broken to the downside, which is what institutional order flow entry is all about. We want to be looking for those types of things, supporting it. So order flow needs to be bearish. And what I taught on, now I don't remember what day it was I was teaching. <laughs> it was in the Twitter space uh, yesterday where I'm talking about uh, order flow. The, uh, when you're going lower in price and you're expecting it to deliver to a discount objective or target, you're looking for up close candles to provide resistance and any fair value gap really keep price at bay from going higher. And you want to see the low of the fair value gap or consequent encroachment be the defining boundary for any kind of retracements. And then once it gets to those levels, you want to see that it sharply moves away with, with speed. It doesn't like to hang around there. If you have those signatures while you're watching price print lower, you are watching a sell program deliver and order flow is bearish. You don't need trend lines, moving averages, depth of market, ladders, volume profile, none of that stuff. You don't need any of it. And you're just reading the actual high low and close price and the feed that's being delivered real time. So uh, we could be seeing you know, a surge in dollar. We could be seeing a decline in foreign currencies and equities. There's a lot of saber rattling, and I'm not going to talk too much about what I mean by that, but if you just look at the headlines, uh, certain countries are making pretty bold claims about what they're going to do in retaliation to certain things that other countries have done or implying that they have done. And that is a cause for concern, and that's going to cause what? A risk-off scenario. 
risk off means it's going to be a flight to quality. And I'll let you <laughs> come to the conclusion if you think the dollar is quality. But generally what that means is, is risk off is the dollar gets bought up. So higher prices in the dollar will pressure foreign currencies. So even if you have a buy signal in Forex pairs or equities or index futures, in those conditions where dollars rallying, it's real hard for those markets to get traction. They might rally against it for a short period of time intraday, but it's usually short lived. And then finally, it'll just be like, ugh, wilt. And it goes the other direction in relationship to a higher dollar. Everything else usually drops. And it's that teeter totter effect. One goes up, the other goes down. So it's a back and forth type of balance. But don't think that it can't in intraday price action move in tandem for a very brief period of time, which can be confusing for a new trader or someone that's expecting it to be lockstep, where every little tick up in the dollar sees that every little tick lower in index futures or equities or Forex. Sometimes you'll have that little crack in the correlation where it can be confusing, which is why you want to have intermarket relationships and analysis in your trading. Like I don't trade the Dow. I can't stand that. I can't stand that index. It, it's just too spotty. It's I don't like it. Okay. It tends to overreact more sporadically than the NASDAQ where NASDAQ can overreact and over deliver versus the ES S and P S and P ten, tends to be much more smoother, more, well, controlled. Let's put it that way. Smoother. doesn't have as much erratic over exaggerations in price. Dow can be like that, but also it can do things in ranges and chop around before moving in tandem with NQ and or ES. So that's the number one reason why I get asked a lot. Why do I not want to trade that one? It's because it has its specific characteristics that I don't favor. You might like that. You might be able to trade in the Dow. And because you're hearing me say, I don't like it. If you're successful trading and don't, don't change. Don't let me influence something that's already working for you. But I'm answering a question and I don't want to be crucified for my opinion and or the reasons and decisions why I do something or don't do something with a particular market like crypto. I have no interest in it. So I try to be as whole, hard and bold about not liking it. So that way people don't ask me because I, I get asked all the time, like synthetic indices. I don't know anything about them. I've never had any experience with them and I don't know how the nifty 50 and the index Indian markets, I, I don't know anything about them. So I have no experience. So I won't talk on it because I don't have any experience, but the things I do have experience, I'll share my opinion with you. But I think that we may be seeing because of all the things that's going on and we're talking about ET coming now, <laughs> Foo Fighters are all over the place getting shot down. The, uh, there's a lot of weird stuff coming out. And the more heavier factor is obviously W A R you paying attention and you need to be mindful of that because it's going to have an impact on a market, every market. So real quick, I'll do GDP and then we'll get into the business with ES. All right. So here is pound dollar and let's assume for a moment that I'm correct. I don't know if I'm going to be correct and you shouldn't assume that I'm going to be by, you know, by default, but let's assume for a moment that dollar does in fact go higher and CPI number causes the dollar to rage higher and index futures to drop hard for uh, Forex pairs to drop hard against the higher dollar. That would, in my mind, lead to a potential run on cable below this low and below the sell side here. We have this imbalance here that we didn't come all the way up into. I like that. I like the fact that we couldn't even come back to this old low. Remember what I was saying earlier about the, the relationships of the wicks in the candles. When they fail to reach the midpoint of the wick and they're like, it's a, it's a high, for instance, something like this. Okay. You're looking at that type of candle. And if you're bearish and the next candle tries to get up there, but fails to get to even the midpoint of it, which is consequent encroachment, that indicates that you're really bearish. 
And the same when I look at a gap, like this sell side imbalance, buy side inefficiency, which is a fair value gap. By, by classification, the PD array is fair value gap. What kind of fair value gap? A sell side imbalance, buy side inefficiency. SIBI is what I usually abbreviate it in my charts. It's sell side imbalance. That means it's all one sided, one big candle going down. It's lacking efficiency on the buy side. In other words, it needs to be offered at a later time with movement higher by price. The difference between this candle's low and this candle's high frames that SIBI, the sell side imbalance, buy side inefficiency. The market tends to want to reprice back up into the range and as far as the previous candle's low. If we see something like this, I like that. I like to see it in my intraday charts, in my, in my intraday charts for my intraday trades. And it's just what I'm expecting to see price do. I like the fact that we did this here, but we have to be mindful because we went simply below this Thursday's low and we closed pretty much right at it. Or well, let's look at the difference here. The low is 1.20572 and the close, yeah, we're just above the close, but essentially almost the close is just a little bit above the high. I mean, the, the low tick of this candle here. I would have been warning you saying that we close down below it and that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be immediately lower because I see this and this is what you want to write down in your notes too. be, be very careful about what I'm about to say because I'm giving my opinion and it's before Sunday's gap well, before Sunday's opening I don't know if there's going to be a gap it can open relatively unchanged and that would be expected frankly because CPI is on Tuesday and the market's going to be not terribly interested in doing a whole lot before that because that's the main event. That's the big ticket event for this week, CPI. Everybody knows that's been trading that CPI is that tornado. It's that tsunami. It's the uh, weapon of mass destruction, <laughs> okay, <laughs> where the market just simply gets destroyed immediately and anyone that's on the wrong side of the marketplace will get hurt. So because I'm expecting that carnage on Tuesday, like every other trader is, Monday's trading probably will not be all that eventful. I could be wrong, but I don't suspect that there's going to be a whole lot of movement ahead of CPI. Can you trade on Monday? I believe you can, but I don't want you to think massive big range unless they start shooting down all kinds of Foo Fighters and then, you know, it's all over the news. It's probably going to cause all kinds of weird stuff to, to happen then. But, and I'm being obviously facetious when I'm saying that, but if we're expecting lower prices, the best signature on Sunday's opening would be a gap lower opening. And then a rally back up into it overnight or into Monday morning. And then does it show a willingness to want to go lower? If it does that, and we're, and we're leaving like intraday lows on Monday that are relatively equal. And then we roll into Tuesday and those relative equal lows are still there on Tuesday ahead of CPI that I'm going to feel further emboldened that that's where CPI is going to rush through and then dig into, you know, something like this, this low here causing dollar higher and pound getting wiped out below that low right there with a large range on Tuesday. So that's what I'm doing generally on Sundays, well, not Sundays. I'm, I usually do my analysis on Friday nights late or really, really early on Saturday before everyone wakes up. And I'm not spending as much time as I'm doing. It talks, it, it takes more time for me to talk and articulate how I think, which is why you're listening to me as much as sometimes you guys complain about my me jawboning and going on and on and on. I have to justify why I'm saying what I'm saying. Cause if I don't, I have a thousand questions and then people email me and they text me and they send me messages through trading view and they're They're angry. You're not answering my questions. And I, I take that to heart. I don't, I don't want to come across as someone that's not willing to answer your questions, but I, I'm only one person. 
So I try to do as much as I can in my dialogue to try to circumvent the need for you to want to raise your hand for a question because 90% of the time you're going to hear your question that you have. If you write it down in your journal, it'll get answered in the normal process of going through. Now that we're doing it daily and we're doing it live now, chances are you're going to get the immediate feedback that you're looking for. You just have to be patient. It's not imperative that you get your that you get your question answered right now. As much as you feel like it needs to be answered when you have it, you don't. Nothing is that sensitive that you need to know right now. Okay, it's better for you to adopt a mindset and patience, forge that patience and discipline because you're not going to get the immediate feedback you're looking for when you take your trades. So you might as well condition yourself for that. Okay, I might be a source of frustration right now, but the market's going to provide you even more frustration because you're showing you're impatient. And when you put a trade on, it's not moving for you in your favor. You're, you're, you're going to feel that same impatience, but it's going to be worse because your money's on the line. Whereas right now, you're learning. You're not trying to risk any money right now, which is the best way of learning. So I'm looking for, in my mind, a lower gap opening on Sunday. But because of, this is important to write this down, because CPI is the big event on Tuesday, it isn't really needed to see a big gap lower opening. It might be relatively close to where we closed on Friday, indicating what? When I see that, if I see that, then I think that Monday will be really quiet and we're going to be waiting for CPI. And that's a reasonable forecast. That's something that anybody technically would reasonably expect to see in price. And why? I just explained it. But now watch what happens. If we see a gap lower that's big, that creates a really good trading opportunity for Monday, even though the big event is on Tuesday. Why do I say that? Because the despair, the, 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 the difference between where we closed on Friday and where we gap open on Sunday, if that's a large gap, on Monday morning, there will be a tendency for that market to want to rally up into the range that's created by the gap difference of Friday's closing price here and where we open. And I'm actually talking about S&P while I'm, while I'm looking at the British pound, but it's okay. It's fine because even though they are different, they're going to trade sometimes very similarly because of risk on risk off factors. So while we won't necessarily see the gap the same way we would see in S&P, because if you toggle and I'll show you when we get to um, the S&P. But there's no way of toggling like regular hours and electronic hours for Forex. It's always the same thing. Once we start trading on Sunday until we close on Friday, it's all continuous delivery. So you have to look at gaps and separations between trading sessions differently. And I'll teach you more about that as we go through this year. But if there's a gap in ES, like I taught you last week, and my private members are aware of, this is how I teach the indices market. You, you need to be considering what we did the previous session, how we closed and where we opened at 930, because that difference, that is a real liquidity void. Write that in your notes. Okay. The PD array that opens at new day and at new week, they are liquidity voids because there's no trading that took place at all. So the answer to a lot of questions I've been getting, what are those, you know, they're, they're named obviously new week opening gap, which is the difference between Friday's closing price and Sunday's opening. Regardless if it's a higher opening on Sunday or lower than Friday's close, the difference, whatever that is, that's new week opening gap. As a PD array, a very specific element of uh, price delivery, it is a liquidity void, a real liquidity void. This right here has been unfortunately labeled inappropriately as a liquidity void. And I've used it because of the people that were talking to me on baby pips. They used that term and without me trying to confuse them, I just went, okay, well, we'll just call it what you call it. But it's not. It's not a void. There was buying and selling in here. There absolutely was buying and selling. Even though it was a down closed candle, what it is, is it's a sell side imbalance, which means it was primarily too much of one sidedness going lower. 
So the algorithm will want to reprice to offer fair value by going back up like it does here. The fact that we didn't come all the way back up to that area here and close into this candle's low, to me, indicates that that is weak, decisively weak, because of the same characteristic that I taught you with the wicks. If we can't climb up to the midpoint of a wick above a candle and we're bearish, that is extremely indicative of a lower moving uh, market. So it's those types of things that I'm weighing as each candle's forming. And you'll hear me talk about it when we're doing live streams. I'll say, this is interesting to me. This is what I'm wanting to see. I don't want to see these types of things. If I say something like, okay, we, I don't want to see that right there. That's not surprise. That's not me afraid that the market makers are going to move on me. That's not me thinking, oh, they just, met, they just changed the algorithm. It's just something I don't want to see this right now in the context of what I'm looking for. And I have to see it have a, uh, a resolution to that immediately. And it'll make more sense as you watch me do more of it. But I'm not ever looking at price saying, oh my goodness, where did that come from? That's always a possibility when you're reading price. I'm never going to be surprised or shocked. Now, I would be, <laughs> I would be in, if we were in a market and I'm expecting price to deliver like it normally would. And for a non CPI day, and it creates a, a CPI run out of nowhere, boom, that's a black swan. Then you will hear me say, what the, you know, it'll, I'll go off the rails because it would be completely unexpected. It would be completely untradeable. But barring those instances, which is always a risk. That's why I tell you all to learn how to do this in a demo. I never encourage you to go into a live account because those very instances are what we're moving into. We're, in go we're going into very hard times. And the market right now, you're learning how to do this in the most difficult time. Do you know someone other than me that is an online personality that's a trader? If they've been trading longer than the last three years, Ask them what their opinion of what the market conditions are right now and how does it relate over the entire spectrum of their experience as a trader. If they're honest and if they've been trading for a long time, I guarantee you they're going to tell you this. These markets right now are very, very difficult. It's not because they or myself are poor as a technician or a trader. It's very difficult right now. And for a new student coming in, you have no appreciation of that. You have no appreciation for what it takes for someone to be able to sit over the charts with you, whether it be me or anyone else, and convey with a great deal of conviction what the market's likely to do because we are working very diligently to try to come to the conclusion of what these markets are trying to arrive at. And I've made no, made no bones about it. I've been very candid about it. In fact, I've dialed my trading back so far, it's, I've, not, I've not had this little bit of engagement since we started all this stuff in 2020. 2020 caused me to put the brakes on a lot and slow down a lot. So to keep myself engaged and not lose my focus and my effectiveness as a technician, I'm working with you. As a community, I'm showing you what my analysis is calling for. I'm doing executions. I'm doing live streams now. I'm calling every individual one minute candle. So it keeps me focused because if I spend too much time away, which was what my concern was and why I, I stayed continuous through the holiday break too, because I know these markets are very difficult and at least I'm staying very close to the rhythm of what it's doing. If I stayed away for two weeks or so, I would be rusty. I'd be like a boxer that hadn't been in the ring for a couple months or up to a year. Yeah, you don't want to get hit by that guy. But someone that's been active, they're going to be more reactive to their punching and be able to slip their punches. And you don't want to have that kind of ring rust, especially you know, you know trying to do this on the live stream. So anyway, I say all that to say that I do believe that CPI is going to be probably a instigation to a higher dollar and a lower factor for like index futures, stocks, and Forex. That's my opinion right now. That can absolutely change based on what we do on Sunday's opening. I mean, we could see something happen between now and Sunday's opening 
that causes a geopolitical, you know, wartime response. You know, and everything that I just said is completely undermined, which would mean nothing because I'm not trading on Sunday. So these are all things that you need to be aware of. And some of you are coming into this thinking that you need to know and you must know. Otherwise, you don't know what you're doing or I or I or anyone else doesn't know what they're doing. If we can't predict the opening price on Sunday, no one can do that. So stop placing that emphasis on you as a student learning how to do this, because the markets are not going to be consistent in that regard. You have no idea where they're going to open just as well as I don't know where they're going to open it up at six o'clock every weekday. When we have that one hour close between 5 p.m. New York local time, when the index futures stop trading and when they reopen at six o'clock, I have no idea what price they're going to open up at. Now, I can teach you, as you'll learn, how they're likely to gap it lower or gap it higher. But I don't know what price they're going to open it up at. And I don't know what the immediate response is going to be when they open it, because it could be open with a gap lower and then run away real quick and leave the gap opening for a day. There's nothing saying that it has to repeat back up to, not repeat, but reprice back up to that gap and fill it immediately. But some of you are thinking simply because there's a gap, oh, it's immediately, let's go right there. And that's not how it works either. There's a lot of things that you have to weigh out. And that's what makes this difficult as an educator because knowing what you are expecting, I already know 90% of the questions you're gonna ask. As soon as I say something, or before I say it, that's why I pause, I'll take a deep breath. Because I'm, I'm taking in from experience, I know what I want to say, but I also know by experience, when I say certain things, 50 questions are going to mount up in your mind because of what I'm saying or did not say in that sentence. So I try to be very inclusive in my delivery of whatever I'm talking about. And I'm trying to be very careful and think about the words I'm saying. So because I don't want to waste my time as much as I feel like most of you that are impatient feel like I'm wasting yours when I'm doing these types of deliveries. I'm trying to be thorough. I'm respecting your time and attention. I'm giving you every facet of my experience within the context of every response or lecture. And that's what you would want, not some lazy you know, half-ass approach to, well, it, you do this, you do that, and you should know how to do it after I've done it said one time. That's, that's inefficient as an educator. I wouldn't be satisfied with that. I would want someone that wants to explain things in the minute details and the little subtle nuances that go along with it. And because if I give you a delivery about uh, an, an idea or a concept, just look at the comments immediately. Well, why didn't you look at this? And what makes you think that? When would you not want to do that? And that's why I talk a great deal about one thing and I build on the reasonable questions that I know are going to come as a response to me saying something. And you want to have that from your teachers, whether it be in trading or anything else. You want to know everything that they're willing to share. And that's all I'm trying to do. So let's go over to ES. All right, so here's a daily chart. And some of you are probably thinking, well, why didn't you go on lower time frames? Number one, I don't have four hours to do today. <laughs> and I know a lot of you are ready to eat your potato chips and drink your beer and yell at the screen about guys throwing around a piece of rawhide and hurt themselves <laughs> on a predetermined outcome because there's so much money on this game in Vegas. But that's another discussion. It's rigged. So... <laughs> If we look at the dollar, I'm sorry, the daily chart of the E-mini S&P here. Uh, let's go, let's just go up to the weekly chart. All right, so we have a swing high that's formed after taking out this high. <clears throat> Excuse me. We did go above these relative equal highs, which is what I mentioned was the draw on liquidity when we were down here. We ran up through that here on Thursday. We challenged it on Friday and they said not, not anymore today. So we had a little bit softer close on Friday. We could not get down to the encroachment of this daily candles wick. Noted that. No, note that, okay? So on your daily chart, you're gonna 
have these levels and carry them down into your lower time frame charts. I'm going to allow you to elect whatever colors and thickness and all that stuff. I'm not trying to influence that because when you do your own annotations and you do your own charting, you need to bring your own personality to it. Stop trying to mimic me. What's your colors? What's your candle color settings? Be original. Let it, let it be a, a manifestation of your own individual personality. You will enjoy it more versus being trying to me, me trying to press you into a mold. Copy me. I don't want a copy of me. I'm interested in seeing how you take this information and become your own trader. And I would love for you to be doing what I'm doing now. And I could listen to you and watch you grow as a trader. Like I, I want to see that in my students. Some of you don't want to do that. That's fine. I'm not encouraging the ones that don't want to do it. I'm just saying that I I like seeing the independent thought process of all traders, not anybody that's you know always just a student of mine. I like like that guy Pat Whelan. I like you know trades by Matt. I like uh, Tom Hugard. I like you know just about anybody that be willing to live stream. You know if they're willing to put their time out there, I like watching it because I want to see how they think. Well, in your annotations, you want to bring that to your charts the same way. Your own approach to doing it, your color scheme. The way you annotate, where you put your notes, what you're looking for. I'm going to share the levels that I'm looking at here. And I review this as these are key to me going forward. If you have other levels besides the ones I'm showing, don't erase them. They're pertinent to you, what you're observing. The trades that I'm going to see and take this week may not be the ones that you take. And you would be terribly misguided by me. If I said, only try to do what you're seeing me do. So in your annotations, just at least have what I'm showing you in addition to whatever else you see that is useful to you. You may be observing something that you need to see subconsciously have a effect on price action. And then when it happens or doesn't happen, that moment of insight that you don't know how you're going to respond to Maybe that very thing, that epiphany that puts your understanding about what it is that you're looking to do as a trader right to the point where now you know what you're looking for. So I'm trying to be very careful not to undermine normal cre you know, creative development because it's easy. It's very, very easy for me to derail someone that already knows what they're doing. And if you don't believe that, if you're on Twitter right now, if you have been affected by me talking about my opinion while you're in a trade or about to take a trade, and then your trade would have panned out if you just would have ignored what I said, say, I saw that, I've experienced that. It doesn't mean that I'm less of a trader or I'm better than a trader or either or. It just means that you don't want to have anyone, me at the top of the list, to influence anything that you're testing out, anything that you're trying to do, case studies on, real-time walk forwards. You don't want that to ever be skewed, and I don't want to be a detriment to your development. So if anything in your annotations that you're doing is different from what I'm about to show you, and yes, this is important. Stop bitching because I know some of you are like, get on with it. This is important. These are the struggling points that real students that trade with real money now sometimes have that impact by, by me saying something or if I'm pulling up a level, they second guess themselves. They say, well, maybe, maybe that's not what I should be looking at because ICT didn't mention that. And they're in a trade. They're actually, they have money on the line. And I now subconsciously affected their ability to hold on to that trade. Not because I don't, I don't even know they're in the trade. I'm just giving you my opinion, which is why I constantly remind all of you as students and viewers you can use my concepts and be trading a different direction in the same instrument and we both can be profitable. It doesn't sound possible, but it is just like that. And you won't experience that until you get well-rounded and you have your own experience of being able to find your own setups. And you say, well, wow, he did that today, referring to me, and you did something entirely different. And we both saw outcomes that were positive. But if you are affected by me in my analysis or my key levels, just keep what you trust in your charts, but don't negate having what I'm going to show you. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Okay. At least have this much. 
Anything additional is just for your own observation, and that's wonderful. I don't need you to share that with me. Okay, I get a lot of questions by people tweeting to me. What do you think about this? Did I do this right? Did I do that? What's the outcome? Was the outcome favorable? You need me to tell you that was a good thing? If it's good, it's good. I mean, <laughs> it's simple. Don't rely on me or anyone else to co-sign your observations. You need to be confident and trust the fact that you're doing this on your own like trading is going to always be. So just be careful not to be influenced by me, by me not saying what you see in your chart. If I don't say it, it doesn't mean it ain't valid. It just means that I'm not worrying about that right now. I have something else I'm looking for that would set up a setup for me. The analyst in me sees something that I want the trader, Michael, to engage in this week. And these are the levels that I'm watching. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, hopefully it's been communicated fairly without offending anyone and hopefully bringing some calmness to those that have experienced it because it's not my intent or interest to try to disrupt your learning. So with that said, on the ES, on the weekly chart, uh, we have consequent encroachment of this wick. Make sure you have that noted. Even though we've gone above it here with this candle's high, on Friday, keep that consequent encroachment on that wick right there and add this one. Be mindful of the opening and the high of this down close candle here. Extend that out in your charts. Now, as it as a way of differentiating any levels that I have that I have on one particular chart that I have in my array of monitors in front of me. Anything from a monthly or weekly time frame, I use the biggest, boldest line. I think it's a number four setting on TradingView. That way I know when I'm looking at them, I, that's coming from a weekly or a monthly level. So when I see it, I know there's going to be a whole lot more emphasis placed behind it. Because if you just simply put a regular thickness and the same color scheme across your, your charts, you might lose sight of what that level is. Because while you're learning, you're probably going to have a whole lot of lines on your chart. And over time, you'll find that you'll be using less. You'll actually have a pad next to you like I have, and I have key levels written down numerically. And I write them down in an order like a PD array matrix in the order of where I am in the marketplace. And I write above that price. Like at opening prices, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. At the opening at 930, I write down physically the opening price on, an, on a little yellow notepad. And you've probably seen them sitting on my desk when I panned around the other day on Twitter and showed you my, my stuff the very first day, Tuesday, when we did our first live stream. I write down the opening price. That space that I wrote it down in is empty. But above that, I have several levels that I wrote down that were pertinent to a weekly high or a weekly low or something like I just outlined here. So I'm constantly re referring to where we opened in relationship to these key levels here. So you're going to learn visually by having the levels on your chart. I don't need that part anymore. You won't in the future. You won't need it either. You'll just have those levels written down in your notes and you'll just glance and say, okay, these levels are key. It also keeps your charts clean and it keeps you from wanting to do what? Toggle through timeframes. Toggling through timeframes can disorient you, especially if you're new. If you lose sight of what chart you're on, uh, I can't tell you how many times by answering questions when I was in uh, live sessions teaching in my private group, my old students, uh, I, I would be looking at time frame and get disoriented because I'm going back and forth between two different markets and forget what time frame. And I'm looking at something and I'm giving my delivery about this is what I think is going to happen. And it's not even a time frame that would be useful for that idea. Like I'm looking at right now a weekly chart. If I'm not careful, I could have went right into describing this as this is what you want to see on the next day when we're on weekly candles. So by having things written out numerically and in relationship to how each one of those prices stack up from high to low, where they fall in the in the grand scheme of things, I have that as my my reference point. I refer to that more than anything that I do while I'm in intraday price action. I'm constantly looking at, OK. I'm looking at this right now and I'm on a one minute chart. I'm looking at that and I'm referring to how, how are we in relationship to these levels? Once I hit a level, 
like when I just gave you these levels here, once they're traded to and they're touched one time, they're, they're booked, I circle the price level on my notepad. That means I know we've hit that already. So if I need to refer to it the next day or on Thursday, I know we've already went there before. So if it's going back up there and it goes to a level I've already circled, I don't need a level on my chart to see that, oh yeah, we ran. I do that for your learning so that way you can visually see it's ran buy side there. So I'm thinking, okay, it's ran that. What's the next level of interest above that that I haven't seen be booked or printed yet? And once I see that, then I know that it's likely to go through that level into the next level I'm interested in above it if I'm bullish. So I'm trying to give you an idea of what it is I'm doing because I taught myself this because that's essentially what for, what floor traders do. They give you uh, the, the pivot numbers. They ran their pivot numbers on the night before the open high, low and close, you know, times three minus the, you know, the low price and gives you the high price, you know, the whole formula that gives you pivots. And then I would take those pivots and divide them in half. So it would be mid pivots. So if you have like R1, R2 in the essential pivot, I would have central pivot to R1 and you're probably completely distracted and, and, and confused right now because you don't hear me talk about pivots. It's, it's not terribly important, but I'm just showing you how I've evolved as a trader or telling you rather. And I don't necessarily need a chart. I can trade literally sitting in my living room watching CNB's ticker tape. I don't need every minute by minute interval. I could literally watch that tape and trade. In fact, I used to do that with bonds. I'd have my levels on paper in front of me. I would look at the clock and say, okay, I'm expecting this, 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 this. And as those levels would be touched, I know it's reaching for the next one. And if I saw that level hit, I would wait for the next update to see it down tick. If it down ticked from that price level, then I could be a buyer there because I'm buying in down tick. It has to trade down for me to buy. I don't need a chart. I don't need it. Just like a floor trader did not need a chart. They did their analysis at night. And they carried their levels on their notepad in their hands, a little spiral mead, little, their little cheapy uh, little notepads they could put in their back pocket. Many times that's what most of them were using. And some of them were not even that well refined. Some it would be just a, a, a matchbook cover. <laughs> you know, that's the little, that's what they're looking for. They're holding that in their hand. Okay. Or they tape it, you know, to the back of their hand. That's the levels they're looking at, and they're holding their tickets, and they're buying and selling, and doing their whole screaming bit business. They're not they're not looking at fair value gaps; they're looking at actual hard line levels. So keep that in mind when you're watching this, because you're putting way much more emphasis on drawing heavy amounts of lines on your charts right now. When you want to try to keep the goal in mind that you're going to have a very clean chart in the end, and then work off of real numbers. So that way you're not looking at the chart because you have no idea how much influence having these levels drawn on your chart is going to have over your analysis. You'll be fearful. Oh, it's going back to that level. Subconsciously, you're thinking, okay, the last time it went to that level, it did this or didn't do that. And that's going to be a distraction versus watching what price is doing real time on these one and five minute charts. So you want to try to keep your focus on what's the main thing. The main thing is where's liquidity, where's inefficiencies. You want to have those levels from the higher time frame down. Now I'm not doing monthly. It's not necessary here. But on weekly, what I just described here, that's my weekly key levels for going into this week. That's it. They may evolve once we see Monday in CPI. But for now, these are the only things I have right now for the weekly chart. It's pretty simple. And I did more jawboning about other things supporting why these are important. But what you're supposed to do with it over time, that's what I just communicated. I work off of a notepad and just simply writing down the wrong numbers more so than having lines on my chart. But the data and derived expectations and how I'm reading price, I'm teaching you that by having the lines on the chart. Over time, those training wheels, like on a bicycle, when you first learn how to ride a bike, you'll take them off and you'll just read the chart naked. And that's where your, your, your graduation is, where you can see it, execute on it with nothing on the chart and no influence or commentary by me. Then you don't ever need to come to ICT videos or watch live streams that I'm doing. That's how you know you, you're now independently minded and you can do this on your own and feel confident in doing it. And that's a good feeling. You should be striving for that. That's the goal I have for you. You need to adopt that as well. So let's go down to the daily chart real quick. 
All right, so here is the daily, and we have a volume imbalance here, and we had a volume imbalance in here. So I mentioned, I don't remember where I mentioned it, but um, because there's two of them here, you want to have all four of those levels annotated on your chart. So this closing price, this opening price, and then have the same color scheme for both of them, and then a different one for this closing price and this opening price. Why? Because they're two different respective volume of balances. One is during the up delivery for buy side. Notice the candles are up and then the next candle is up. This one here is a down close candle and the next candle is down close. So you want to make the distinction between that and how price, if at all, returns to either one of them. So you want to use like a very large number four level width on your charts for annotation. And like say this might be, I don't know, it could be green because it's green candles. And it could be a heavy black from number four thickness because of these being down close. And that'll help you understand which one it's referring to. Now you might look at this and say, well, what's the big deal? They're almost the same. It's a big deal because they're going to respect very specific levels if they come back to it. And if they do trade them this week, once it does that, I'll come back and show you what I want you to take away from it. But not having them on the chart, you won't you won't have the benefit of knowing, you know, whatever whatever may be a follow-up discussion. They might not even be a factor this week. They may not even go there. You don't know that right now. We haven't even opened a new week yet. But I like those uh, two volume imbalances. I have those levels in mind on my notes. And we have consequent encroachment of this wick here. So be mindful of that. Consequent encroachment on this candle. Keep that going forward. You want the mean threshold of this down close candle, which is the midpoint. So you put your Fibonacci on the low to the high. Whatever the midpoint level is, carry that all the way through this week you want to also note the opening price on this candle here which is 4077.00 because that's an order block we've dug into the body of that candle here so the most important point from now on is if we're bullish we shouldn't see it go below the mean threshold which is half of that but if we open higher come back down and stop at consequent encroachment or fail even go that lower then we're going to go go back up inside this gap here so that's how we would use the information for an example for an example and i think that's going to be it for the daily chart so weekly and daily those are your key levels it's not a lot but those levels you want to have annotated record them also what they are don't just just have the levels there write down in the description like inside the trend line Okay, there's a way of annotating with the text feature on trading view. Annotate what those levels are, meaning the opening price on January 30th daily candle. Just in a very, very small font, make sure your level is annotated like that. And then the consequent encourage, I'm sorry, the mean threshold of the order block, the same thing. You would have that annotated as January 30th mean threshold daily bullish order block. And you can abbreviate that the way ever, whatever way you want to have in your chart that is meaningful to you. Which is why I'm not annotating the chart like this, because you're all going to try to mimic me. And that's not what I want to see. Not because I'm trying to hold anything back. I'm not trying to, I'm not being lazy about it. I'm teaching you how to do this on your own. So that way it brings your own personal flair to it, okay? All right, so let's go down into a 60-minute chart, an hourly. Okay, um, on the range, what my eye is doing is I'm looking at this low, all the way up to this high, and I'm looking for a midpoint without even having a Fibonacci there. Okay, just looking for midpoint, and then we are trading right here, essentially at what equilibrium. So we are opening up while the market itself 
traded the inside of this large range. Why did I pick this high in this low? Why am I not talking about this high in that low, right? That's exactly what some of you are thinking. <gasps> He's in my head. Where was the most dynamic price movement? It's this move here, from here to here. So that dealing range is parent. Everything else, these little minor movements and small little retracements and dealing ranges, they're subordinate to all of the movement from this low up to this high. It's going to be subordinate to what? The relationship to premium to discount from this high to that low. So if you split that in half on this eyeballing it, all of this here and higher is premium. So we're at equilibrium. So what I'm looking at is how much time have we spent in discount or premium, which has, which has been done more. Clearly, we've spent a whole lot more time in what? A premium inside the range between this high and that low. What has been explored? We went down into a discount a little bit, but look how fast we came back to equilibrium. I don't want to read too much into that because it's Friday. That's what we're seeing Friday's price action there. And we don't know how we're going to open up. But let's just say we open lower. Okay, say we open lower and we want to come back into the closing price or any one of these daily candles, I'm sorry, these uh, hourly candles could act as the point of which it doesn't need to go back to the closing price on Friday. If we're weak, if we're looking for lower prices and higher dollar, a lower opening could see us come right back up, not completely return back to the closing price. Why? Why would I say that? Because we are essentially closing at equilibrium and we've had multiple times here, you know, moving back and forth. We don't necessarily need a very clean return rate back to Friday's close if we get lower. What it's likely to do is if I'm correct and I don't know this, I'm just giving you my thought process that you're wanting to be trained by me. You want to see what I do and how I do it. This is exactly what I'm doing. I'm doing it right now, real time for the first time looking at the charts. I'm telling you what I think and what I'm seeing. If we gap lower, and we trade higher, I don't need it to return all the way back up to Friday's close. Whereas if it were a move where, for instance, we ended the day on Friday like here, and we gap down on Sunday's opening somewhere down here, I would expect a full return back to the Friday's close. Why? Because it's really extended. And here we've had back and forth, choppy, 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 choppy. But more specifically, it's coming right back to the midpoint of the parent price swing of this high and that low. All of that range, that big explosive movement, it's been resisting going higher. It just keeps coming back, spend some time. One more time, real excitement. Oh, there's a speaker. And then that fizzled out. Oh, we're going to really do it now. It's going to run higher. And then it fizzles out. We've taken out relative equal lows here, so sell side's been taken. The argument for the bulls would be, okay, we've taken sell side out. We should see a gap higher, trade down, try to fill the gap all the way to the close here. Now, see what I just did there? If we gap lower, it doesn't need to come all the way back up to the closing price on Friday because we've had multiple times back and forth in here. In the gap between Friday's close and where we open on Sunday, if it's like 77, 84 in that area, I wouldn't need to see a complete return back to Friday's close. I wouldn't need to see that at all. Because it's indicating what? Heaviness. And it's going to want to do what? Reach into this low, attack the low here, and then you want to have that fair value gap noted, and then the sell side liquidity resting below here. So that's the levels that I'm interested in on the downside as discount. But devil's advocate, if it gaps higher, I would expect a full return back down into the closing price. Why? All of this inefficiency, we're gapping up into it. We don't know that. I don't know that. But I'm assuming that for the sake of argument, say we gap higher. And this is obviously a great deal of exaggeration where I'm pointing to. But Conceptually, I'm trying to commute the idea that a gap opening below Friday's close in this instance is not equal to the same expectation I would have if a gap higher 
formed because we've already spent a great deal of time up here above the midpoint of the low to high. So you have to think about the market in terms of overbought and oversold without the basis of having an indicator at all in your chart. How many times did we try to rally here and not go higher? One, two, three, four, five, six times. And then finally, on Thursday, it gave up the ghost and traded lower. Now, we don't know if they've taken the market down here to accumulate the sell stops to send it and reprice it higher. The clue will be how we open on Sunday. Today, later on today, how we open is going to be influential for determining whether or not this is going to be resuming higher or if it got lower. I don't need it to return all the way back to the Friday close. And I'm expecting heavy weakness right from Jump Street. And then this low and this low will be uh, Monday and into Tuesday CPI number. That would be my objective based on this. Also note that we've had this high since we traded lower here. We went above it here, choppy, pressed above it here on this high relative to that high. Pulled back one more time, dug into it. It just feels like they had to come off of that discount because this was really, really low. And they did not take out that low here. And it didn't even come down to consequent encroachment of that wick, which should be also noted on your hourly chart. So because we've come all the way back up into essentially equilibrium relative to the high here and here, I would favor a down gap, an opening lower gap later today. And I wouldn't require or demand the market comes all the way back up to it before it goes lower. I wouldn't need that because we've already had multiple attempts to get back to equilibrium and taken out this buy side liquidity that would be resting above that high. Flipping the script, if we gap higher, because we've had a run below sell side here with this drop and that we've climbed all the way back above, I would view that as a breaker. And the closing price, that would be all that's necessary because then I would interpret it as, okay, they opened it here, traded back down into the range, which is the breaker, which is this candle over here, that up close candle. Extending that candle forward, that should be on your hourly chart. If we gap higher, it can come down and retouch the Friday close. And then I would expect to see it try to reach up into all of this inefficiency. If we gap higher, show responsiveness at Friday's close and move higher, that would indicate that I'm probably wrong about my expectations on the market and they might send this thing higher on the CPI on Tuesday. Now stop for a second. What I just gave you is not plan A, plan B because I'm telling you I don't know which one's going to pan out. I have to wait and I have to see what the market does on Sunday's opening. And then I weigh it out based on the things I just explained to you. That's forecasting. That's your own, that's my analysis, but that's your own way of internalizing what you expect to see price perform and deliver. It's not equating to a trade entry. All of that is going to be at a later time. These are things that I'm looking for to justify what? Bias. I don't have a bias right now. I never have a bias before Sunday's opening. I don't ever have it. I have an inclination. I have a want to see in price, but my will cannot be exerted on the marketplace and see it come to fruition. I have to align myself with what the market's going to do. And what I just outlined was the two circumstances that I would like to see either if I'm going to look to go short, I want to see these types of things form in price. If I want to go long and fade what I'd rather see in price coming into this week, because I would like to see dollar go higher and everything get smashed lower. I'm expecting that. I'm completely comfortable with being wrong. I've already co-signed it and I've said it before. You've watched me now two times call CPI, what I think CPI was going to do. And I was dead wrong. But after CPI hits the market, I'm going in and I'm finding winning trades and executing on them. So don't weigh so much on the, the outcome of a forecast. Forecasting is not profitable. You don't lose any money either in that. A forecast is an opinion. 
and I'm trying to share my opinions with you before we see the week begin. It's not a measuring stick. It's not a, a report card. ICT was right or wrong. I don't think of it that way. It gives me a plan of action. If it does this, I'm looking to do that. If it does this, I'm looking to do that. Whereas 90% of retail traders are just going to chase whatever happens. I'm not doing that. I'm thinking about it logically that we've spent more time trying to go higher all last week and finally giving up the ghost, but I'm being mindful that we've come down below these relative equal lows where sell stops were resting. And we failed to take this low out or even go into consequent encroachment. Now think about what I mentioned earlier about those little short stubby wicks. Sometimes it can trade down to those short stuff, even though this isn't a short stubby wick, but this is almost essentially what I'm referring to where this drop down, then it retraces. Watching price at real time, you probably were having this level if you're aware of what I've been teaching, the consequent encroachment on, on candles wicks. You may have been expecting that low to be reached or maybe even go completely below this low here, but it stifled that decline and started rallying up into the range. What range? This high to that low. Now I'm not thinking, look at this high, look at this low, split it in half, there's equilibrium, and then wait for it to get to uh, equilibrium and that would be a good sell. I don't, I don't, I'm not thinking that right now. I'm thinking if we gap higher, trade back down, it's gonna to wanna to go higher to go higher above here. That's what I would expect because then it would be just simply coming below these lows here to absorb that sell side as counterparty and then they're, they're looking to reprice it higher. So that's what I'm talking about by saying you need to be sitting down with someone and explain why they're thinking the way they're thinking. If you're just following someone that's giving you signals, they may be profitable, but they're not really helping you understand how to trade. They're just spoon feeding you. And there's an audience for that. Now, I'm not saying that if that's what you are and you don't want to learn this, it's too difficult and you subscribe to that, that view and there's people that are doing it and they're profitable, they're giving you signals. There's nothing wrong with that. In that instance, there's absolutely nothing wrong. But if you're trying to learn how to do this independently, the worst thing you can do is subscribe to someone and, and get signals when they're not explaining why they're doing it. Because it'll, it, in my opinion, it would create a sense of anxiety because then and now I'm dependent on this person. What happens if they get the case of the ass and say, you know, I'm not going to do this today. Or they get in an argument with their spouse. They have a bad day. You're bringing your financial decisions to this person who's never disclosed why they're doing the trades anyway. That takes a great deal of faith, more so in my opinion, than simply putting the work into understanding why you're taking the trade in your own analysis. But that's my personal opinion. It may not be in agreement with all of you or even the large part of you, but that's just how I think about it. So it's in my mind more, more likely, and it would be more favorable for me to see a lower gap, not come all the way back up to the um, closing price on Friday, show it as weakness, as a breakaway gap. That's why I would like to see that because then it would indicate to me that it's breaking away from this retracement, which was only taking us back up into equilibrium relative to this low to high back into this old order flow all these old lows in here it pulled back up into that and look how sloppily it was doing it it was going up and then come down up and then come down up it just feels like it's just reaching one more time one more time one more time and it's like that rock climber he's just trying to swing get that last bit of a grip but there's not enough chalk on his hand it's sweaty and he slips off and that's what i'm expecting that's what I see here. I'm absolutely likely to be wrong. And I'm okay with it because it's Sunday. I don't know what Sunday's going to do. But that's that's my thought process going into it, okay? So hopefully you can appreciate that. Not put the Don't bet the farm on it, okay? Because if I, if I had a, a strong inclination about what it was going to do, I would, put, I would be putting my own money behind it. And I'm not. So it's just an expectation on the marketplace I'm holding. All right, you can see again, one, two, three. Retail's gonna see this as a bull flag here and then wanting to go higher. 
Uh, now, if we do gap higher, that changes everything. And I'm just giving you all the reasons why that does change it. But here, bulls that went long in this or wanting to go long, they're going to want to see a gap higher, a gap and go type of you know event. Um, I would like to see a gap higher if I'm bullish. Gap higher, come back into it, return all the way to Friday's close, and then show me willingness to want to rally. That's how I would wait and see. I'm not trying to just simply go in there and blindly buy the retracement back to the closing price. I want to see, does it give me a shift in market structure after that return to Friday's close? Flip the script. Gapping lower, I do not need it to trade back to Friday's close. Because we have all this in here. Gapping lower, it can make an attempt to trade higher. Leave the gap open partially. It doesn't have to come all the way back to or even halfway. It's better if it doesn't. What would that communicate to me? It's exceedingly weak. It can't even fill the gap. You see, that's what you're trying to do. Whether you know that is what you're expecting going forward every weekend before Sunday, you want to read price, write down what you would expect to see relative to the Sunday's gap opening. Not because you're trying to train yourself with the belief that you're going to know how to do that, because I don't, and I've been doing it for 30 years. I don't believe anybody can tell you where it's going to gap open. If they did, they're way better than me. And they, they know something that none of us would know. Nobody has that information. So, but you want to be conducting yourself as a means of case study and walk forward testing and building confidence and trusting the fact that you don't need to know this piece of information, but how you're going to respond to that as an analyst. If it gaps lower, what do you reasonably expect to see it do? And what don't you want to see it do? What is not likely to occur? Well, here's an example of something I would not like to see and I don't think is likely to occur. A gap lower and rate from the opening lower go raging higher. I could be wrong, but the likelihood of that happening is less likely than a gap lower coming up, leaving the gap open, not completely closing it in, and then working lower to take that sell side and maybe dig into that hourly consequent encroachment wick and that wick's low. And that subsequent fair value gap to the left on the hourly chart before we went down to the 15 minute time frame. All right, so we've had one, two, Three times as a three drives potentially pattern. And that's why I would also like the fact that if we gap lower, I would put more emphasis on this reaching, just simply get into the liquidity resting above here. Why was it doing this? Higher, higher, higher. Because the liquidity that was trailed behind this low, I'm sorry, this high, as the market went lower, it was taking that liquidity, starting to break down. What happens then? Any stop that was higher than this was brought back down to what? This high again. They come right back above, skip this high, right back above this high again with this run. Then they start dropping it again. Okay, now I finally did it. Now we can get short. Now we can get short. Where's the stop loss at? Right back to an old high. You might be thinking here and here, but my focus, my eyes going right there. And they take it once more time up above it again. It just so happens they're taking out each individual high too, which is killing two birds with one stone. That's how I'm internalizing that price action. It's too, it's too compressed, meaning that from the low here up to this high, all of these fluctuations back and forth, even though they made higher highs and I guess higher lows, I'm not convinced that that's something that's bullish. Like I see that as just constantly reaching for liquidity that would be in the form of buy side, keeping anybody from potentially profiting from a lower gap opening and never coming back up to those levels again to give them a safe entry, which is what they would want to see. More specifically, not coming back to this old high. So hopefully that kind of you know, justifies what my internalization of price action, what I am forecasting for my own observations. If it does anything other than those potential scenarios, I'm sitting on my hands and doing nothing. Wow. I just gave you the upside if I'm wrong, what I would look for. I gave you the downside, which is what I'm looking for. The things that I just outlined, if the price doesn't deliver those very things, I'm doing nothing and I'm not going to be anxious about doing nothing. 
I'm going to be completely content sitting still because I'm going to be requiring more information to happen on Monday at 9.30's opening. Why? Because there's no news events that's going to be of interest to me on Monday. Why? Because Tuesday is the CPI number. It's going to be the big event. A lot of people are just sitting on their hands. There isn't going to be a lot of movement until C you know, CPI hits the market. No one wants to assume positions ahead of that number, that, that report that comes out on Tuesday. So there is not any reason to be excited about doing big moves in Monday. Because the big move is absolutely predictable on Tuesday. The CPI is bringing it. Hopefully that makes sense, okay? And I think that's going to be it because we've already went down the lower time frame stuff talking about it real time on Friday. So hopefully you glean something from this. And I'm sure you, know, you probably got a million other new questions because of it. But you know, until we get the opening price on Sunday, you know, well, tonight I'm talking like we're on a different day. Uh, once we get the opening on Sunday, and most of you won't be caring about it anymore because you're going to be drunk and watching, you know, <laughs> grown men run around, you know, with spandex on chasing a football. So enjoy that. I don't even know who's playing in it. That's how much I care about football or sports. But I hope your team wins, whichever that one is. And uh, if you're out and about, make sure you get home safely. And I'll touch space with you by way of Twitter, I'm certain, to let you know when I'm going to start my live stream in the morning. Okay? Until I talk to you next time, be safe.